If you've got your Bibles, I want to invite you. We're going to find ourselves, continue to walk through James. We're going to be in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And our big takeaway this morning, what we want to leave here with, if we're going to have one big idea for today, it's this, is that the heart, the heart that is not intimate with Jesus, all right, so if we're not walking, if we're not growing, if we're not spending time with Jesus, the heart that is not intimate with Jesus, it produces a believer who does not live for Jesus. Does that make sense? The heart that's not intimate with Christ is going to produce a believer that's not walking for Jesus Christ. It's not living for Jesus Christ. A few years ago, we wanted to buy a dog, and so we're real picky about the types of dogs we want. We either want uh, this monster mastiff, or we want a little toy something. I, there's nothing in between. And so we, we, we settled on this little Shizu, and then we liked him because they didn't shed, and we found this person that, that was a rescuer, and so we went and bought this dog, uh, this rescue dog, and she said this was the most beautiful, best dog she's ever seen. Uh, she was a liar. <laughs> that dog, every single time we took the leash off that dog in our own yard, would take off, just go. And we lived outside of town, but not too far away from a, a, a four-way intersection with a, a grocery store and a gas station. It was pretty busy right down the road. Well, this dog went off one day, and I couldn't find it. I could not find the dog, didn't know what was going on, and uh, made Facebook posts, and somebody found the dog, brought it back. It's like it just went and bathed in a mud-filled pit. And it was hair, it was clunky and nasty and stuff, and so we washed it and cleaned it. It was just so nasty. A couple weeks went by, we were out in the backyard playing, having a good time, and the dog shoots off again. It took about a week and a half to find this dog, and it's like it found a mud pit, rolled in it, and then found a bunch of garbage and rolled in it, and then got in a fight with another animal. And then someone found it, and they said, hey, come to our house and get it. And it was like they intentionally kept the dog in the worst possible spot in the yard because it was so nasty. And I get this dog, and it's just the, the amount of disgustingness on this dog. I, 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 I wanted to do some things to this dog to teach it a lesson, but I didn't. You know, we washed off, we cleansed it and everything, and, and, and again, it ran away a third time. I didn't look for the dog anymore. <laughs> it would go, and it would, it, would, it, would, it would leave clean, it would come back filthy. It would run away and do stuff I didn't want it to do. How often have your words ran away from you? How often has a hot temper caused you to let loose words that bite like a snake and sting those you're talking to? How many times has despair caused you to respond in fear and say a thing that cuts so deep it's taken years to heal? How about maybe your gossip or, or maybe some backbiting to someone that you didn't think was going to be a big deal, but it, it's running around like a ravaged dog through all your friend circles and your people at work, causing destruction and havoc you never thought it would. Or maybe you're the type of person, you're driving along in the car with the family and everything's good and you just get, just get irritated with the kids and, and, and you let off this foul thing out of your mouth and like a skunk it just stenches up the ride until you get to where you're going. Today in our text, James is going to pull us in real close and he's going to tell us that if we're going to be disciples... That follow Christ, we cannot be double-minded. We cannot say one thing and believe another. We cannot believe one thing and practice another. So the previous two chapters, James has been building this case. He's been laying out for us some things, some principles of the way you and I are supposed to live, very practical ways to order our lives. He's told us how to persevere under trials. He's told us how to gather wisdom for our lives. He's told us how to treat those less fortunate than us. He's told us to how to make the gospel center in our life. He's told us that, 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 that there should be some evidence of faith and works in our life. 
And now James is coming in chapter 3, and he's going to continue this idea of single-mindedness as he discusses one of the most important things that I think we take for granted or we, we, we give little thought to. And that's how we talk. See, James is going to come, he's going to show us the dangers of the tongue and the need for us to monitor and to control our speech. And he's going to, more importantly, point back to Jesus' instruction of our heart. You see, corrupt language, what James is going to show us, and we don't like to think this way about ourselves, but James, what I think I love about James, one of my favorite books in the Bible, uh, what I love about James, he doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't try to, try to make us feel good about what he's saying. It's just necessary. It needs to be said. And, and it's really a hard book to preach because I don't necessarily like to preach real hard, but if you're going to, we're going to cover James, he doesn't leave a lot of cushion for us to feel good about what he's saying. James comes and he says, hey, a corrupt Heart will produce corrupt language. Corrupt language comes from a corrupt heart. If the heart is so bad, so too will the language, will the speech, will the behavior of the individual be bad. What about us here today? What does our language say about us? Does it point to Jesus? Or do we find ourselves living a double-minded sort of life, believing one thing and and saying or, or living another? See, beloved, we want to be disciples, men and women, children and teens who have hearts that are captivated by Jesus, who have hearts that are intimate with Jesus so that our lives are single-minded in the way we live them, and that what we believe is evident in what we say, what we believe is evident in what we do. This is the only way we can live our lives and glorify Christ. Let's look at our text this morning. James says, let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and, and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brother, and these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Father God, as we come to your text, your word this morning, we've been praying, we've been singing, we've been asking, we've been pleading to you to invade our space today, that you would glorify yourself as as you fill us with your spirit, as you give us, Father, humility of heart to hear the word of the Lord and to respond in a manner that glorifies you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. James starts his instructions and rebuke on the tongue in a very surprising manner, doesn't he? He he doesn't start where you think he would start with. He starts with the leader. He starts with the teacher. He says the leader is to watch out. He said not many of us should become leaders. Not many of us should become teachers. He says, why? Because the leader is held in a higher standard of character because he or she is a servant leader. James says the the leader is to be held in a higher standard. He says, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that as such you will incur a stricter judgment. James tells the church, he tells you and I to impose self-limits on the number of those who teach in the church. Why? Why does James do this? Does he he not want the church to be well-equipped? Does he not want people to come in and teach the church? No, that's not what James is telling us at all. James is telling his readers, both then and now for you and I, that teaching in the church on any level is such an important role, is such an important position that those who teach will have a stricter judgment in their lives. Not just their life in the church, but the life they live outside of the church. 
See, James is saying the teachers of God's word are to be both masters of the scriptures and masters of their own life. So we now have an obvious question, right? Why shall the teacher, why shall those who proclaim, who teach others, why will they incur stricter judgment? Here's the deal. Number one, the teacher, anybody proclaiming the word of God is to give the word of God and not their opinion. My opinion on the word of God matters not because I'm not God. The teacher's opinion on the word of God matters not. It only matters what the word says because the word gives life. The teacher doesn't give life. We're not to give personal opinions on the word of God. Second, because of the platform of the teacher, of the speaker, what he or she says affects many lives. What you say bears weight beyond the moment, beyond yourself. And number three, teachers are really to expected to be living out the truth they teach. So James is actually trying to protect both the individual and he's trying to protect the church. So from what we know, and we're following James about the life and the character, James says, hey, what the teacher teaches is going to be judged, but also what the way the teacher lives is going to be judged, and what they say is going to be judged. And this is important because those who wish to teach, if you're here and you have a desire to teach, that's a, that's a good thing. But don't rush into the position or don't take it lightly, please. Because you have a godly responsibility you're going to be judged more harshly, not just here in the church. But what happens is so many times people are in the church and they do this thing and they live this way in the church and they look well and they model well, but outside of the church, their life does not model Jesus Christ. And, and we take that lightly. We don't think that's a big deal. James says that is not the correct thinking. He says if you have any position in church where you're teaching someone the word of God on any level, he says, you will be held to a stricter judgment of your life as a whole. James also says that the leader is to always model Christ's likeness and especially watch how he or she talks. We're going to look at this a little more closely in verse 2. But James is not telling you and I or anybody who teaches or anybody in any leadership role, he's not telling you and I to pretend to be perfect, but to recognize, simply recognize that in a position in the church for those who teach, whether that's a pastor preaching on Sundays or whether that's one of our, our, our leaders teaching in the good news clubs uh, after school, we're to model Christ's likeness, especially in our speech. He says you do this because you never know who's listening. You never know who is listening so let us be careful what comes out of our mouth. And for those who are listening, they may not be as mature as you are to handle the conversation that you're engaging in at that very moment. So we need to watch what we say and who we say it around. And we want to speak words that uplift. We want to speak words that encourage. We want to speak the word of truth. We want to make sure as teachers, we want to make sure as leaders, we're modeling Jesus Christ. We're modeling this word. And, and that we would be humble enough to accept correction when it's needed. Now what James is going to do throughout the rest of the passage, he's going to give us uh, three similes and two metaphors referencing how our tongue and how our speech can be both positive, but really he's going to focus honestly on the negative here. And we want to learn some important truths from this. And the first thing we're going to see in verse 2 through 5 is this. The tongue is small. James says the tongue is small, but powerful. But before diving into first simile, what James does in chapter 3, verse 2, he paused to continue this previous thought, and he segues now into verses 3 and 5. I love that James admits, listen to what he says, for we all stumble in many ways. I love that he says right up front, he's talking, he just talked to the teacher, he's just talked to the leaders, and he's the half-brother of Jesus. I love that he comes out and says, hey, every one of us are sinners. None of us are perfect. I love that idea because so often, sometimes you may get this idea that whoever is on this platform doesn't struggle with sin. That's not true. We all struggle with sin. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. That, that verse in Romans 3.23 telling us we're all falling short of the glory of God is not just a verse that is applicable prior to salvation. We still live that out every day of our lives. We still every day fall short of the glory of God. But the beautiful thing is, is we read on the screen in Romans 5.6 that at the right time Jesus died for the ungodly and that's me and that's you. So yeah, we all fall short, but we don't need to pretend that we're perfect. 
no one is immune to the struggle of sin. Don't think just because someone has a title or a position or, or, or reached a certain age, they're, they don't, they're not bothered with sin. And from this thought, James gives us these two ideas. Notice the two pictures. Look at the two pictures he gives you in verses 3 through 5. He paints this picture of a bridle in the mouth of a horse. And he gives you this picture of a rudder controlling a ship. Think of a bridle. Think, think of being on a horse, this you know, 1,500-pound animal. And you've got this thing. And I don't know if you ever tried to ride a horse without a bridle. It doesn't work very well at all. They kind of do what they want. But you take this bridle, you put it in the, in the mouth, you clamp down that tongue of the horse, and you can literally move that 1,500-pound animal anywhere. He'll kick, he'll yawn, he'll, he'll do all this other stuff. But you just take him where, and he will go wherever he wants to do, go, wherever you want him to go because of this little bridle. James also gives us this picture of a rudder, and I like that he uses this picture. You, you think of these ginormous cargo ships and these rudders that are literally hundreds of times smaller but those rudders will take that ship anywhere that pilot of the ship wants to go. And James uses these, these similes right here to show us how powerful, even though the tongue is small, it's very powerful. It can do a lot of stuff in the life of the person. He doesn't want us to underestimate the power of the tongue and the effects the tongue can have. See, the brighter, br bridle and the rudder are neutral. But he says the tongue is not. Notice how he describes the tongue. He says the tongue likes to do what? What does James says the tongue likes to do? He says the tongue likes to boast. We, the tongue wants to boast about itself. And here's the deal. Most of us, if we're going to be honest, we don't try to boast to make ourselves look better than the person next to us. We don't try to, and most of us won't flat out boast. We'll do some passive aggressive boasting. You know understand what I'm saying? Oh. Uh, but we don't do that. If we're going to be honest, we don't do the boasting to try to make ourselves look better than someone else. Honestly, we boast. Most of the times we boast in life is to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. And we do that because we're not secure in who we are in Jesus Christ. James says, you don't have to worry about boasting. Don't do that. Don't, 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 don't allow yourself to become this tool for the devil. James says boasting is like a fire. This small fire can set an entire forest aflame. I, I remember, you, you know, I've, I've talked to you about living by the sawmill, growing up inside the sawmill. Well, outside where our trailer was, there was a lot, and then there uh, was uh, an auto repair shop. And me and my brother was out there in this lot one day, and it was, it was overgrown. They hadn't come cut it in a while. So we decided to go out there. They weren't going to cut it. We were just going to light it on fire and, and get it all down. We were going to do it quick. We didn't, feel like, we didn't feel like cutting the grass. It wasn't our grass cut. We were just going to light it on fire. Well, here's the deal. In August, grass, it doesn't burn the way you think it's going to burn, especially as a 13-year-old. It lit on fire so quick, it almost caught our house on fire. It jumped the fence. It, it took out most of the old cars that they had behind the auto parts shop and almost took the whole auto shop down. Off of a little bitty fire, who would have thought it, right? This is what James is telling us. See, you sitting here, and you're hearing me begin that story, and you already know the little flame with the little flames under. You know what it's going to do, right? James is saying the tongue is the same thing. Don't underestimate it. James says just because it's small, don't think it's not powerful in your life to cause great damage. James says don't be this person that boasts about your life, about your dreams, about your achievements, about your kids, about your jobs, about your talent. He says this boasting is like this fire. See, when we have an unchecked tongue, it can come in and it can assassinate a person's character. It can destroy a reputation and an unchecked tongue, and you've seen it and I've seen it in churches all of our lives. It can ruin a church from one person's tongue. We often get into conflicts. This is what happens. This, this is how quickly the tongue can, can ruin us. We'll get into a conflict with one another and Real quickly, we, we do this so swiftly, and so we're so skilled at this. We'll get into a conflict with one another, and within about five minutes, we have laid aside what we were actually arguing about, and we'll start attacking the person's character because they simply disagreed with us. Quickly taking the tongue and setting aflame that relationship, right? James says that the tongue is powerful, and he also says in verse 6 to 8, the tongue is dangerous. He says the tongue is dangerous 
Look at verse 6. He says, The tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. Notice what he says to end the verse. And it itself is set on fire by hell. James says the tongue is a world of iniquity that defiles the whole body. It sets the course of our life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell, doing the will of Satan. He leaves no room for misunderstanding. He tells us right up front, the tongue left unchecked will destroy lives. This word he uses for hell is this word Gehenna. And Gehenna was this place in the Hinnon Valley, just south of Jerusalem, just south of the Temple Mount. And it was basically this large, nasty, sweltering, smelly, stinky fire pit where people would just go throw all of their garbage and it would just burn continually all the time. There's just always this wretched smoke. That's why they had it south of the city, uh, but below the city, so the smells couldn't reach up to the city. And, and, And with this word picture, James is saying, hey, look, when we allow our tongue to just live unchecked because the heart is not being intimate with Jesus, what we're doing is creating this wretched, foul stench that no one wants to be around. James says the tongue is a wild beast. He says every beast of the earth has been tamed. But notice what he says. No one can tame the tongue. Now what's important here is this. James lets us know something really important. And you may be hearing you're you're a Christian and you get scared because you say, oh, I can't tame my tongue. Yes, that is correct. Neither you or I have the power in ourselves to fix ourselves. You understand? I don't have the power to control my tongue. But as I spend time with Jesus, Jesus will transform my heart, and my heart will be moved to speak words of life that are glorifying God. It's the Holy Spirit within us that transforms our heart and takes full control of our behavior and our speech. So think about your own tongue. Would you describe your tongue, your speech, as tamed? How many fires has your speech started and fanned at work, in your marriage, to your parents? At school. James says instead of spewing poison from our lips. And further the cause of Satan. He says. He says don't try to conquer your tongue on your own. He says turn to the one who can conquer both tongue and heart. And he says this because what he tells us in verse 9 through 12. Is very important for us to understand. The tongue is very deceitful. It's deceitful. Notice what he says. Look at verse 9. He says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, verse 10, come blessing and cursing. My brother, and these things ought not to be. James says this shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't, we shouldn't speak blessings in, in one side and, and cursings in another. A man and his family got home from church, and they sat down for the meal and the man prayed, and he thanked God for the, the house they had. He thanked God for the clothes they had. He thanked God for Jesus. He thanked God uh, for the wonderful meal his wife prepared. And he said amen. And about two or three minutes after, he started talking about the day. He complained about the preacher because he preached too long. He was complaining about some stuff going on in the church. He was complaining about his job. And his, his little girl, little six-year-old Susie, she's sitting there. She says, Daddy, did God hear you when you, when you prayed? He looked at her real silly. Of course, of course he listened to me when I prayed. He said, well, Doc, did God hear you when you complained? I said, yeah, I guess. She said, well, Daddy, which one did God believe? He said, we, we hear that and we, we laugh and joke, but how often is that very scenario true in our own conversations? How quickly can we shift from saying good things about somebody. This is, and this is how we like to do it practically. This is what it looks like. Oh, Brother Allen, he's a good guy, man. He cleaned that pond out so good. Him and Brother Joe, they did such a good job. But, and I praise Allen. I'm thanking God for him. But let me tell you what gets on my nerves about Allen. See how quick the shift happens? And nothing gets on my nerves about Allen. I love Brother Allen. But this is what happens, right? This is how quick, how easy it is for us 
to in the same breath speak words of life and affirmation and speak things that tear someone down. James comes flat out and says, this ought not to be. See, when we speak out of a heart that has not been communing with Christ, we will speak things that do not honor Christ. Why? Because our mouths reveal the contents of our heart. Our mouths reveal the content of our heart. In Matthew chapter 15, Matthew records Jesus' words in verses 18 and 19 that are very important that James is more than likely reaching back to and pulling this section out of. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew 15 verses 18 through 19. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. Jesus says, out of the heart is going to overflow. And if your heart is not being communing with Jesus, it's going to be filled with the garbage of this world. And you're going to spew out garbage. Now, what we try to do very honestly, we try to manage our speech depending on the type of company we keep, don't we? We will manage our speech based on the type of company we keep. But when we do that, we need to recognize this. We can hide and camouflage the heart for a little while, but what is inside will eventually come out. See, we, we can play this hide-and-seek game with our words and our heart. We can fool those around us to make them think better than us. But what's going to happen What's going to happen is at some point in your life, you're going to be faced with the situation where your emotions are real high or your emotions are real low, and you're going to have to respond real quick, and you're not going to have time to prep yourself, to prep your mind, to prep your words for the people and situations you're around. And what's naturally in the heart is going to automatically come out when your emotions are high or when your emotions are low, and you're going to reveal what's really inside. Now, will it be, as James says, life-giving fresh water? Or will it be this bitter salt water that comes out and and ruins everything and it's not good for anything? That's the question James has for us. Are we pretending to be people who are filled with life-giving water only to when we get behind certain doors, we're just nothing but bitterness and we're not good for anybody? So James lays out for us the evilness of our language and he shows us the dangers of a divided heart. So, so what can we do about it? Well, the remedy, what we've been, I hope you've been picking up on the whole time, the remedy for a rebellious mouth is a heart that's intimate with Jesus. If you want your language and your actions to glorify God, you need to commit to spend time with God and God's Word. If we want our language and our actions to glorify God, we need to be people who spend time with God's Word. Think of a lion trainer. You ever seen a lion trainer? He goes in there, he's got, he's got all his gear on, he's got the whip, and he's got the gun. But what's this other third thing he has in his hand? It's a very weird thing the lion tamer has in hand. He has a short stool four-legged stool, and he holds it by the seat. And he, and he pokes the line, he pushes his stool up in the lion's face, and he turns the, the handles like this, so, the, so it does this. And, and he doesn't very often have to use the whip. He rarely ever has to pull out the pistol. He just tames this lion by the stool. Why is that? Well, this stool has four legs on it. And what happens, the lion is trying to focus on the four legs, and he gets all confused. He gets flabbergasted. He just, everything falls out, and he, he becomes tame. And feckless, and he's at the will and disposal of this lion tamer. See what happens in our lives when you and I, we get to focus on all these things in the world, it doesn't work. We are made to be single minded people, single minded people with a single minded purpose to glorify God, to be disciples who make disciples. And instead of focusing solely on Christ and allowing the word to fill us and then, and then filter out through our lives, We foolishly, but oftentimes we do this with really good intentions. We try to compartmentalize our focus, and we try to have three or four things going on at one time. We focus on being a good spouse. We want to raise the best kids, right? We want to make people happy. We're we're trying to find me time at the same time. 
We're fulfilling our life's goals, and we're throwing in trying to live for Jesus when we have the time, when we have the ability, when we have the energy. I'll live for Jesus when I'm doing that. But what ends up happening most of the time for most of us is we get overwhelmed because we can't do any of those things well because we're not giving any of those things the energy we need to give them. And we're not giving the one thing that can positively affect all those things, our time and our effort. And that's the Word of God. You see, beloved, when we focus on the Word of God and we make knowing and growing in Christ our chief aim, the Word of God will pour naturally into all of your relationships, all of your endeavors, all of your hobbies, all of you things you have. And this Word of God will begin to shape you and form you and inform you. It will empower your goals and your dreams. It will strengthen your marriage. It would help you talk to your kids better. It will children. It, it, it will help you live that life. And teenagers and college people, man, it will help you go out and live for Christ in a way you never thought possible. And instead of, instead of living one anxiety, fear-filled episode to the next, because we have a split, compartmentalized focus, when we focus on the Word of God chiefly, primarily, we make that our aim, we'll have this, this life-giving, empowered experience for the rest of our lives. And as your heart is changed by the Word, so too will your life change by the Word, and so too will your speech. And instead of speaking from selfishness, pridefulness, instead of speaking out of a lustful heart or arrogant heart or a fearful heart, what will happen is because you've been pouring your life into the Word of God, you will speak from a heart that is captivated by the love and the compassion and the grace of Jesus. That is how God's Word can affect your heart. Can I ask you this morning, how's God's Word been affecting your speech lately? Your habits? Are they honoring God the way God desires them to? Because as you and I, as we spend time in the Word of God, our heart will produce fruit for the glory of God. We will not have to play Christian. You will not have to put on a Christian costume in certain places and take it off in others because your life will be saturated with Jesus. You may be here this morning and you don't know Christ. You've been trying to fix your life. You've been trying to fix your situations. You've been trying everything you can do to improve your marriage, to be a better parent, to make better decisions. You've been trying to be more emotionally and mentally healthy. You've been trying to understand the world around you, trying to do the very best you can be, be the best you can be, but nothing you try, nothing seems to work. And the reason that nothing is working is because and I say this with all the love and compassion I can, and I want you to hear my heart. The reason is nothing is working is because you don't have the power to fix anything. You don't have the power to get better or to improve. You don't have the power to give yourself true joy and peace and contentment. Only Jesus can offer you those things. Only Christ gives that to you. And if you're here and you don't know Christ, can I ask you to turn to Jesus this morning? Submit to Christ. Repent of your sins. Commit to follow him. And he says, I will come and I will invade your life. And the peace you're looking for, you have. The singleness of purpose that you want, you'll get. Because I will be your life. And for all of us, both the, the, the lost and the saved here, this truth is for all of us. A heart that is not intimate with Jesus produces a believer who does not live for Jesus. As our band comes, I want you to consider a question with me this morning. If it was only one thing, only one thing we could do to judge, only one thing you could do to, to, for the barometer of your heart, what does your speech say? What is your mouth saying about your heart? Are your words truly reflecting what's inside? Are the things you say and things you don't say, do they show Jesus or the sinful passions of the world? I want us to truly consider our hearts this morning. And maybe you're here, maybe you recognize 
that the way you've been walking and living your life and you've not been being that model that Christ desires you to be, you've not been being that representative of Christ to your family, to your friends, or your coworkers. Christ calls you and I to do the hard work of examining our heart, humbling ourselves and confessing our sins. That's a good thing. Would you confess your sins to Christ this morning? Would you lay that at his feet this morning? Would you give him your all this morning? Would you commit to spend time with his word that your life may be of single purpose? Because the only way a behavior change happens is when a heart change happens. Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing together. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper together, I want to give us an opportunity to respond to the Word of God. And maybe you're here, you just need to do that. You just need to sit back down and you need just to spend some time with the Lord. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus. We want to celebrate that. Maybe you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We want to celebrate that. But beloved, this Word of God has been for us this morning. May we give our hearts to the Lord this morning. Let's pray.